Rex Harrison stars in another intriguing adventure transcribed from the private files of Rex Sonder. <laughs> Concerning political corruption. When bullets are exchanged for ballots, a trip to the death house is the usual action. And now, the private files of Rex Thunder. RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, and first in television, brings you the celebrated star of stage and screen, Rex Harrison, in another exciting story taken from the private files of Rex Saunders, radio's newest man of mystery. We hope you enjoy these weekly stories of intrigue and adventure. And for another adventure in home entertainment, we suggest you try RCA Victor's fine line of radio and television products. Now on display at your RCA Victor dealer. Now for our story. The girl in the black silk dress sat opposite my desk, her face partially hidden behind a veil. She said her name was Peggy Lawford and that she'd come to see me on business. When Miss Lawford pulled the veil from her face, there was a brief moment of silence during which I came to the firm conclusion that she was unusually attractive. The silence was broken by the snap of the clasp on Miss Lawford's pocketbook. Mr. Saunders, this is yours. A thousand dollar bill? Mine? Uh-huh. If you take my case. Miss Lawford, I uh, have a thousand dollar bill. I could make it more, maybe fifteen hundred? Mm-hmm. Sorry. Two thousand? I'm afraid you don't understand. I'm an amateur in this business. Amateur? Strictly. Oh. But you don't act like an amateur. Only where money is concerned, I suppose. You see, protection is a full-time pastime with me. But this is very urgent. It's a matter of life and death. Who? My sister Helen in Chicago. She's disappeared. Now I'm afraid something terrible has happened to her. Well, I suggest you try the police. No, this isn't a matter for the police. If you come to Chicago with me, I'm sure that... You can handle it. But I told you... Mr. Saunders? Yes? If it isn't money, what is it that makes you take a case? Mm, intrigue? It has to appeal to me. Well, don't I appeal to you? You're a blunt young lady. You don't answer my question. You're forcing me to a quick decision. You should be used to that in your business. Every moment counts. Will you help me? I'm leaving on the 8 o'clock train to Chocolate. Rex, I'm, uh, that's more data on Cochran. I'm... Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you were busy. That's all right, Alex. Miss Lawford and I have completed our business. But, Mr. Saunders... Oh, Alex. Yes? Get our things back. What? We're leaving for Chicago. But this evidence we're collecting against Big Jim Cochran. It can wait. I'm on another case now. One that, uh, appeals to me more. I don't understand... This morning you were so intent upon bringing Cochran to justice. My interest in being presently sidetracked by Miss Lawford. Peggy. Rex. Peggy. Call the depot immediately for a reservation on the 8 o'clock train tonight. All right. It won't be necessary to call the depot. No? No, I've already taken the liberty of making the reservation for you, too. Well, Mr. Saunders, don't I appeal to you? <laughs> and then Mr. Cochran, he gives me that once over, not so lightly. You should have seen him. He fell for it like a ton of bricks. Oh, it's work, Peggy. He's a very smart girl. Now, you keep Saunders out of town until this investigation goes over. Don't worry. I've got him all tied up at the end of the string. And you keep him tied up in Chicago with that phony missing sister act until I give you the sign to cut him loose. <laughs> Sorry I'm late, Alex. Oh, I was getting worried. Our train leaves in eight minutes. Where have you been? Uh, attending to business. Is our luggage on board? Mm-hmm. It's all in our compartment. Well, hurry and get it off the train. What? 
We're not going to Chicago. But, Rex. Where's Miss Lawford? Oh, in her compartment, number 38. It's the first one inside the door in this car. She's waiting there for you. She says there's an important new development. Mm, yes, I was expecting something like that. This case of Miss Lawford's missing sister is taking on surprising twists. What twists? I'll explain later. Get our baggage off the train and meet me back here on the platform. Right. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to Miss Lawford's compartment about the important development. <laughs> Come in. Peggy, what's the matter? You're, you're trembling. Well, I thought you'd never get here, Rex. I'm so frightened. Why did you have your door locked? Well, what happened? It's this note, Rex. Look at it. If you know what's good for you, don't look for your sister. You might not get to Chicago alive. It still kill me. I expected something like this. You did? Mm-hmm. I received a similar warning over the phone to stay off this case. Well, what are we going to do? Now, don't you worry, Peggy. I'll see that everything will be all right. Oh, You'll stay on the case? I'll stay on the case. Now, do you feel better? Oh, no, it's especially with your army around me. It's just an extra service I extend to my clients. It doesn't affect my amateur standing. <laughs> nice. It's very comforting. Mm, it's convenient, too. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, holding you this way was the most convenient manner of getting your compartment key out of the door lock. What? I'm going to need this key, Peggy. What for? Peggy, I don't like your friends. My friends? I always make a habit to do a little checking up on my clients. What are you talking about? Cochrane, I'm talking about. Big Jim Cochrane. And as I said, I'm staying on the case. Only it's the state attorney's case against Cochrane. What, what are you talking about? You asked that before. You, you can drop the act. I know all about you. Cochrane hired you to sidetrack me. Could have been a beautiful trip. I'm sorry. Ah, that's my cue. Give me that key. Give it back to me. I'm sorry. I don't usually do this in the case of ladies, but you forced me to make an exception. What? You... Now, relax, Peggy. You've got a long trip ahead of you. Why get off to a bad start? Ah, no, then don't worry. I'll explain everything to Big Jim Cochran. <laughs> Cochran. Hendo. You seem surprised to see me here, Cochran. Why should I be surprised? I thought perhaps you had an idea that I'd left town for Chicago. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm busy, Hendo. What do you want? I just dropped around to tell you that Peggy Lawford is on her way to Chicago. I saw her out personally. Don't you know, Cochran, you should never send a woman to do a man's job? I uh, said I was busy. Anything else? I told you this before, Cochran, but frankly, I enjoy repeating it. Your overlord days in this town are near an end. There's a new administration in power. So they say. It's a good, clean administration that's going to sweep your rackets right from under you. I've been investigated before. And this will be your last. This administration's investigation will succeed. Not a chance. Nobody can touch me. Administrations come and go. The big Jim Cochran stays on. Not much longer. You can try all the tricks up your sleeve, but none of them will work this time. And as for me, Cochran, I'm keeping after you until I get the evidence for the state's attorney that's going to put you where you belong. Behind bars. <laughs> You can buy it for a song. Yes, for as little as $12.95, you can now own the wonderful, economical RCA Victor 45 attachment. This neat, compact, easy-to-play record changer can be attached to and play through your present radio, phonograph, or television set. And think of it. With no trouble at all, you can load up to 14 records on your 45 attachment. There are no posts or clamps to adjust. Then, press a button, relax, and listen to the clear, distortion-free music of your choice. Wonderful music. Yes, the RCA Victor 45 system sounds better and plays easier than any other system of recorded music. What's more, you'll find an enormous selection of 45 records to choose from. Now you can hear all your favorite recording stars 
on handy, non-breakable seven-inch records. So, as soon as you can, be sure to see and to hear the superb, low-cost RCA Victor 45. I received the message to rush over here to the state's attorney office. Something startling developed, Jason? Saunders, you remember Ernie Rigo? Hmm, I certainly do. And he used to be Big Jim Cochran's chief lieutenant. We killed him under falling out several years ago. And we just got word along the grapevine that Rigo's back in town. My boys are trying to locate him. You think Ernie will talk? With the proper inducement. Rigo's just aching to get back at Cochran. He knows Big Jim's racket set up from top to bottom. Now, if Ernie opens up, we'll get an indictment from the grand jury. Just like that. Where do I come in? Well, Rigo's not likely to listen to anyone from this office. You're the man to deal with him. And what do you say? I say we'll find him as soon as possible. Now, look, Jim, I told you there's nothing to worry about. We haven't got a chance of getting the grand jury to return an indictment against you. That makes you so sure of it. Well, I needed my way into that job in the state's attorney's office, didn't I? And I got ways of needling out information, too. I, um, I didn't tell you that I'd become the ladies' man, did I? Vic Conway, Lady Kennedy Luke, that's what I am. Oh, uh, come on, come on, what are you getting at? Jason's secretary, Nora Wheeler. The state's attorney trusts Nora. She keeps his confidential file. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, that's it, huh? Uh-huh, that's it. No, I kind of goes for Vic. She's, uh, better, huh? Yeah, better than that, she is ugly, you should. <laughs> she couldn't even get a whistle past the old man's home. I'm saying to her father, I'm probably the first thing parents has ever given any attention. And, uh, you thought you handled the confidential file? Yeah, that's what I said. And, Jim, we're going to have the inside track on that phone just as long as I keep Nora Wheeler floating on a white cloud. <laughs> If I'm walking on air. Do you know? Uh-huh. Always dreamed of it, but I thought it would never come true. Then why not? Well, I... I'm not like most of the other girls. I'm not very pretty. And... Hey, hey, wait a minute now. Oh, no, no. No, stop that. You think just because the others smear a ton of makeup on their faces and because they spend half their time in beauty parlors, you think that makes them pretty? Well, it doesn't. They can't hold a candle to you, Nora. Yes. Come here. Oh, dear. Hey, maybe I uh, shouldn't be in your office like this. It's all right. All the others have gone for the day. Yeah, but uh, those papers on your desk, maybe that's uh, confidential stuff. I shouldn't see. Oh, don't be silly. Those papers couldn't be of any interest to you. Besides, if I couldn't trust you, who could I trust? Okay. I'll put these back in the fire. Then we can go to dinner. I'll get my hat and be right back. Yes. Yeah, Nora. I suppose it is a very wild question for a woman to ask. But what is it? Why did you pick me up? Why did you choose me from among all the others? Why? Because I know I know you can give me everything I want. <laughs> Yes, Jason. Uh, we located Ernie Rigo. Oh, fine. He's in a roomy house on Waterfront Street. Number 234. He's using the name Regent. 234 Waterfront Street. All right, Jason. I'll see if I can prevail upon Ernie Rigo to become the state star witness in his case against Big Jim Cochran. <laughs> Keepers in the district were forced by James Cochran to pay an established protection sum each month. All right, Rex, I have that. Well, Rita, what else? I can't answer, Mr. Sonny. Well, I think we plenty. 
This testimony ought to get an indictment from the grand jury. No doubt about that, Alex. Now, add this. Ready? I solemnly swear, in the presence of the undersigned witnesses, that this statement is true and was made by me without force or duress. Without force or duress. Yeah, here you are. All right, we're going to sign here. Okay. Cochran finds out about this. I think I'll just sign it like that one. You're going to give me the protection you promised. You'll be all right if you just stay in this room until next week. And then I come and take you before the grand jury. This can be a long time, Mr. Sanders. Cochran's got this sign sewed up. Mm -hmm. No longer. His stitches are becoming fast undone. Yeah, but what if he gets wounded? Don't worry about Cochran. The first he'll hear about this will be in the jury room next week. After which he'll be placed in police custody. There's no way he can find out about you, Rigo, before the grand jury convenes next Tuesday. Jim, Rigo's in town. No, the punk's in town, Rick, so off. He's going to spill to the grand jury next week. You're crazy. That little crumb wouldn't open his mouth. They know it's better than hey, that. Jim, listen to me. When they call you before the jury, you won't have a chance. Rigo's going to give you the work up and down. What are you talking about? I got it out of Nora Wheeler. She's got Rigo's sworn statement in the file. Oh, a rotten double cut. What is it? Well, they're keeping them under cover in a dump on waterfront state until the jury meets on Tuesday. What happens if Rigo doesn't show next Tuesday? The state's attorney still has Rigo's affidavit. When he produces that, you're finished. But it's still in the office file. Nora Wheeler still handles that file. Yeah. Okay. You take care of your end with Nora. I'll take care of my friend, Danny Rigo. Hello? Danny. Rigo. What is it, Rigo? Someone spot me. I can see it from my window. He's been looking up here for almost an hour. Better get down here fast. You recognize him? Yeah, I think it's... Hmm. Vigo, what? Uh, Vigo. Vigo. Uh, well, Jason, as far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt that Cochran was instrumental in Vigo's murder. No doubt. But that has to be proved. Well, you'll have the opportunity to prove many things about Cochran after the grand jury returns the indictment against him on Tuesday. I'm not taking the case to the grand jury Tuesday. What? That's why I sent for you, Saunders. To tell you I haven't had a case now. What do you mean? Rigo's testimony on Cochran is missing from our files. Miss Wheeler, I realize that you've been through a trying day, but I'd like to talk to you for a few moments about the missing affidavit. Of course, Mr. Saunders. Mr. Grayson, explain to me that you're one of the most trustworthy and reliable employees in the office. I've always tried to be. I can't understand how this terrible thing happened. The affidavit was in the fire when I opened it this morning. I want you to think back a little about any new or sudden friends that you may have acquired recently. What do you mean? Well, have you discussed the Cochran case with anyone outside the office? No. No. Not with anyone outside the office. I see. I thought perhaps there may have been someone who cultivated your friendship for the purpose of gaining inside information. But you don't know any person who would do a thing like that, Miss Wheeler? No, Mr. Saunders. I don't know anyone who would do a thing like that. But, Rick, why are you going to keep an eye on Miss Wheeler? I thought it rather obvious that she was telling the truth. I don't know, Alec. I thought it rather obvious that Miss Wheeler was telling only the half truth. Nora, what are you doing here? I've got to talk to you, Vic. Well, look, baby, I I've got a friend inside business. I'll, um, see you in the morning. Okay? No. We can't wait till morning. Yet, you stole that affidavit. Yeah. Yes. You were there when I unlocked that file this morning. You were the only other person there while it was opened. Come on in, Nora. 
Now, you will say... That's why you were so nice to me. That's why you paid attention to me. Just to get information. Uh-huh, that's right. I thought you really... You thought I really what? <laughs> fell for you? Me fall for you? Did you ever take a look at yourself, a good look? Go ahead, look in that mirror there. Look at yourself. You're the ugliest thing I ever laid eyes on. Go ahead, look. Sure, even you can't stand the sight of it. Please stop. Wait a minute. Go ahead. Let go of me. I want to go home. You mean you're going to turn me in? No, no, no. I promise you I won't. I just never want to see you again. Don't worry. After tonight, you won't see me again. Hey, Jeff. I heard everything the other room. This stands a lucky break. What do you mean, lucky break? She's committing suicide. What? Don't you get it, Dick? She was told off a day, but she couldn't stand the thought of being mad for it. So she takes a dive into the river. That ends the whole thing. You see? And you go along with her to make sure she takes that dive. <laughs> Back to the climax of our story in a moment. It's RCA Pictures' most brilliant achievement, the outstanding value of them all, the fine new 9X571. Yes, RCA Pictures' 9X571 brings you everything you could ever want in a table model radio, yet it's priced so low, it's bound to fit your budget. And think of it, a powerful 8-inch speaker gives you tone usually found only in expensive consoles. A built-in antenna brings in unbelievably fine reception all the time. And the RCA Victor Golden Throat Tone System and the beautifully styled plastic cabinet with a fine wood effect makes the RCA Victor 9X571 an unheard of value. It looks like a million dollars, and you can buy it at a price so low it will amaze you. RCA Victor's 9X571 is the name to remember. See and hear and buy the wonderful new RCA Victor table model radio, the 9X571. Cochran was expecting someone else. What do you want now, Saunders? I'm still after the same thing, Cochran. You. Unfortunately, the state's attorney's case against you hasn't been going so well. Oh? Well, up until now. It took a more optimistic aspect about an hour ago. I finally got the kind of evidence I was looking for. Why well, don't you tell it to the state's attorney? I thought you'd be interested in looking over my Exhibit A first. 
Alex? Yes? Exhibit A, please. Gladly. Uh, Miss Wheeler, step this way, please. What? Miss Wheeler, is this the man? Yes. He's the one. Oh, thank you, Miss Wheeler. That's all for now. Mr. Cochran seems to have been rendered speechless. Well, after all, Alex, there's been a decided twist in events. Cochran, about that dive you planned for Miss Wheeler, your friend Dick Conway took it in her stead, but only a temporary one. You see, I was forced to cool off his heated resistance to me. But when we fished him out, he was much calmer and highly cooperative. Yes, we had a long and very interesting conversation about you. Now, Cochran, shall we get along? I've made another date for you with the grand jury, and this time, you're keeping it. In a moment, Rex Harrison will return to tell you about next week's story. First, an invitation from RCA Victor. Next chance you get, drop into your dealers and look over the wide variety of RCA Victor home instruments designed to bring you the very finest in home entertainment. We know you'll find just the right instrument for family fun at a price that will fit your family budget. Fine instruments with world-famous RCA Victor quality built into every feature and detail. See them tomorrow at your RCA Victor dealer. Rex Harrison, the internationally famous star of stage and screen, to tell you about next week's adventure, transcribed from the private files of Rex Saunders. Next week, it's concerning a Mardi Gras. Concerning a Mardi Gras. A joyous festival hides the sorrow deep in people's souls. Unfortunately, it can also conceal the murder deep in a killer's mind. <laughs> I've been listening to another intriguing adventure transcribed from the private files of Rex Saunders, written by Ed Addison. In the cast were Leon Janney as Alex and Anne Seymour as Nora. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking for RCA Victor. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.